Hey, and welcome back to the Sequence Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Spencer Nadolsky, and we have one of our amazing con- uh, clinicians, Dr. Danielle Don Diego, who's been on with us a few times before, could Hello. also be considered a co-host with me. Today, we're going to be talking about GLP-1s and binge eating disorder, uh, which we have a lot of patients uh, that, who struggle with this, who have come to us, who then finally use GLP-1s. And they finally have relief, even after using other medicines and other types of therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy, which is oftentimes used for it. So let's let's begin. Uh, Dr. Danielle, what are you seeing right now with, with patients? Yeah, so I have, I have a lot of patients with binge eating disorder either diagnosed or I've been able to diagnose them just based on their history. Um, and when they start a GLP-1 medication, you know, the, the indication is typically for the obesity, um, but they are noticing that they are no longer thinking about food 24-7. And a lot of times it's people are using the, the term food noise. Um, and that is where I'm seeing the most benefit when it comes to GLP-1s. And, and that... That is with people with or without binge eating disorder, but those that have binge eating disorder, I think is very significant that they notice that all of a sudden they're not thinking about food. And even if they have a, a trigger or something that might throw them into a binge eating episode, um, it's, it's not doing that for them. Like it, they're not, they're not going into that like they used to. Yeah. Um, they're just not desiring it. Yeah. There's uh so there's a, something called the DSM five criteria. There's, there have been multiple of these throughout the years, but the DSM-5 is the most uh, recent update of the, like the diagnosis of, of binge eating uh, disorder. And so they talk about recurrent uh, episodes of binge eating that is defined as an amount of food that is de- definitely larger than most people would eat in a single period of time under the sim- similar circumstances accompanied by a sense of lack of control, which is important over uh, during that episode. Because that's uh, it's important to make that distinction because it's different from just simply overeating. You feel like you have a lack of control, and then they go on to say that uh, it has three or more of the following. So number one, eating much more rapidly than normal, mm-hmm. um, which you know a lot of us might do if we're in a hurry. We have kids or whatever. Like I know when my kids are like sitting there at the table and they're yelling, I'm like, I better just eat because I got to take care of them so my wife can eat and then we got to get the baby whatever so eating you know more rapidly than normal might be something that people do but um, that can be associated with binge eating here specifically eating until uncomfortably full not just kind of like full but like very very full like you're going to burst type of thing Mm -hmm. eating large amounts of food when not feeling physically hungry and that's another one eating alone because of being embarrassed by how much one is eating um feeling disgusted with oneself, depressed, or feeling guilty after overeating. We have a lot of patients that have that specifically. Uh, Mark distressed regarding binge eating, when binge eating is present. Um, the binge eating occurs on average at least once a week for three months. So, yes. um, And that's something that changed from prior criteria. I guess it, mm-hmm. they, they required more often. But now it's just like once a week for three months. That's not, that's not that much relatively. And yeah. then absence you got to also have this is key as well absence of compensatory behavior such as like purging and um it does not exclusively it does not occur exclusively during uh the course um was it bulimia uh anorexia so ba- it's basically trying to differentiate from other um uh, other types of yeah. eating disorders you're not purging or over exercising to make up for the binge. It's just, it's just the binge episode. That is, that's the difference there. Yeah. So three of those, um, there. So we, there, there's a higher problem. We were just talking about this offline, but those with binge eating disorder don't necessarily automatically have obesity. This is the, the disease of obesity. Uh, we can compensate in different ways. Some people could have binge eating disorder and stay uh, a weight that wouldn't be considered obesity. But in those with obesity, there is a, a higher prevalence of there's more people with binge eating disorder with obesity. Uh, the the normal prevalence in the, just the general population, not in, you know in those without obesity and with obesity, it's it's around like three percent or so of individuals. Not 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 super rare, but yeah. it's even more prevalent. And I know we have a lot of it in our 
program. So it's amazing to see what these drugs can do. What it, in back in the clinic, back in the old archaic days of the clinic, what did you used to use for uh, uh, patients that would come in for uh, binge eating disorder? Yeah. The only medication that has been really FDA approved is Vyvanse, which is a stimulant medication also used for ADHD, um, but is also used for binge eating disorder. And, you know, I had pretty good success with that. Um, but, you know, not everybody's eligible for a stimulant. Um, it's also because it's a stimulant, you have to be in person to get that kind of medication. There's there's other side effects and other things we have to look for, blood pressure, heart rates, et cetera, um, whereas GLP-1s are non-stimulants. So, um but yeah, Vyvanse was, was the main one. Um, and I know we're talking about this a little bit off, off camera too, but, um, patients who have underlying like depression or anxiety that might trigger or lead to, uh, a binge eating episode, which is not everybody with binge eating disorder, but some people have an underlying, um, like launch into an episode because of mood, uh, mood issues, then I'll treat them the underlying mood issue. And sometimes that will also secondarily, um, treat, treat the binge episodes. And those are typically done with SSRIs or SNRIs. Yeah. So yeah, basically if, if I had a patient with obesity, um, who had binge eating disorder before I would, my go-to was topiramate, which has been studied very well. Now, yeah. you know, I did, of course I did TikTok about this and it went viral. And, but then there were a lot of people saying topiramate made me X, Y, Z, lots of side effects with topiramate. Yeah. You lose, you, you can lose your taste. Some people just all sort of, they call it dope. It was called Topamax, um, for, um, migraine prophylaxis. And they called it Dopamax because it made people feel spacey. They get a cognitive, uh, change. Yeah. Real and, brain frog with that one. Yeah. So, so of course side effects with it, it can work really well. If people respond really well, it's, it's great. But some people, it's just like, I can't tolerate it. It's, it's making me feel numb and tingly in places and making me lose my train of thought. That's not good, especially if you're, you know, taking care of kids and, you know, mm -hmm. doing work, whatever. I don't know. So it's really nice that these new drugs, they are not. So I will just say it right now. These new drugs, GLP-1 drugs, are not FDA approved for binge eating disorder. However, if you have obesity, they are approved. And it just so happens that anecdotally, there's going to be studies, but we're going to say it anecdotally, I've never seen anything, I've not even close when it comes to Vyvanse, Topiramate, or the SSRIs or SNRIs. I've never seen any of those drugs plus cognitive behavioral therapy work nearly as good as, as these newer general, I will say these newer generation GLP ones, liraglutide, I think did okay. The sex enda, but semaglutide specifically and, you know, terzepatide yeah. quite, I, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, they, that, that food noise and those urges are, are way are just, they're gone or yeah. completely minimized where people feel instead of that loss of control, they have control. That's what that's, they say. That's the one feeling that patients report that I have never seen described so strongly before in any years of practice before yeah. using GLP ones. Um, it, it's and and they notice it. They they can't believe it. They're like, oh my gosh, is this is this what it's supposed to feel like? Um, and I think that's that's the most powerful thing that when I when I have a patient that they express that that's what they feel. Um, it, it makes me really happy because of course we're treating the obesity, but like they, they get to experience what it feels like without having those urges and those, those desires to binge. Yeah. You know, some of that criteria is interesting because that's what it, it's, a, it's a lot of the, um, distress. There's a lot of distress and people talk about, I was so anxious and stressed before. And a lot of it has to do with the stress and anxiety around food mm -hmm. and eating. So if you alleviate that, then all of a sudden you alleviate a lot of stress and anxiety to where people all of a sudden, I mean, it's just, it, they describe, I mean, we've had Summer on here, who's one of our dietitians who, um, also has taken the medicine who just, it, mm -hmm. she says it better than I could. Cause it's in, it's in her own words. I'm just kind of trying to take a conglomerate of what every patient says. It's just really, they, they, they can't say enough, uh, about it. It's amazing. Yeah. What? Oh, God. 
Well, I was just going to say, what, what do you feel like, do you feel like, um, even on the lowest doses, people notice it right away or does it, what do you, what is, what's your experience? Yeah, that, that varies a lot, but yes, the answer is yes for many people, but not for everyone. Um, just the same as we're seeing people have different weight loss results, um, on lowest doses versus highest doses. Some people are like, we talked about hypo and hyper responders, even, um, at the extremes, some people, they, they get a small dose and, and it just affects their brain very sensitively and, and they notice it. Other people, they don't notice it till we get to higher doses. It's, it's kind of the same spectrum that we've talked about before. Um, and I, I think that's just the huge driver to their success um, with, with weight loss and with potentially binge eating as well. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same here. Some people, like on the lowest dose of whatever medicine it is, they'll be like, oh my gosh, I finally have relief. And then there's other patients, they finally get to whatever, the mid or higher dose and like, oh, now I feel it. It's interesting. And then some people have noticed they have improvement on the lower dose and then the the noise starts coming back a little bit and then they crank it up. Um, One thing to note, I know you have patients like this. There are patients that are trying to eat as few of calories as possible. Mm. Not a good idea because when you're restricting yourself because the medicine helps with appetite so well, um, your body does need nourishment. And one of these potential causes for a binge eating episode would be too much restriction. So you do want to make sure you're giving yourself permission to eat. Like you, you still need energy and nourishment. I've noticed, um, and I think this, this goes more so with patients who came in with binge eating disorder and obesity. Um, there is a lot of anxiety just around the feeling of hunger because I think that, I think it's also a little bit of, um, not knowing what the normal sensation of hunger should feel like. And so any sort of hunger, um, if it starts to creep back and maybe we need to go up on the dose a little bit, they get very anxious. Like, Oh my gosh, is it going to stop working? And you know, I finally feel normal, but at the same time, we're never trying, we're not trying to suppress hunger completely. Um, and, and I think that there is, there is a fine line there and it's, it's different with every patient of really trying to counsel, you know, hunger's okay. Um, it does trigger a lot of anxiety for people and, and go, they might go into that restrictive phase, but, um, we want you to feel hungry. We just, we want to prevent the overeating. We want yeah. you to eat normally. And, and prevent the, the stress and yes. distress really. And, yes. and I think, Yeah. So this is where, you know, we've been talking about it because cognitive behavioral therapy is like a first line treatment for Mm -hmm. binge eating. Um, what I suspect is obviously, you know, we're not a cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, first company people come to us for medicines. But what I suspect is that those who still struggle with some of these, because these medicines, I I can't say they're going to cure everybody. I will say I've never seen anything like them work compared to other drugs, but what I'm imagining us doing, uh, is probably, um, thinking about this cognitive behavioral therapy portion. Anyway, these are kind of some internal talks that we're, uh, looking into in the future, but it it may be that it would be combined best with cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, whether we have somebody in house or we find referrals to somebody else too. So anybody listening like, Hey, I'm on these medicines. It did work a little bit, but I'm still struggling. Uh, it, it can be hard to find somebody, a uh, good therapist out there, but that they are trained sp- and it's not, there's different types of cognitive behavioral therapies. Um, so you have to find someone that kind of specializes in binge eating disorder cause it's yeah. different. That's so. so important. And any kind of, and that goes for any kind of therapy, but especially when it comes to history of any sort of eating disorder, the, the therapist has to have experience and specialization in that area. It's not, um, not everybody is going to be the best at that as goes for most of us professionals in different fields. So it's important. Yeah. Kind of interest. There's, there's actually an insomnia. I'm people that this isn't about insomnia, this episode, but, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, uh, I, um, insomnia, it's a very specific type of cognitive behavioral therapy. So you can imagine going somebody who specializes in that for binge eating. It might not be, they might be able to help you fall asleep, but, um, uh, 
anyway, that's just an aside. Anything else that we yeah. need to talk about? I think we covered pretty much everything, you know, SS, you know, the different medicines that have been used for it, but the GLP-1 medicines really yeah. seeming to have an effect. F, not FDA approved, so I have to say this is an off-label use. But if someone has obesity, it's reasonable to use a GLP-1 medicine anyway. Um, and I will say that um, they just they seem to work extremely well. Yeah, and it, it you know it will be interesting. And I'm not saying that this is something that should be done now, but it will be interesting in the future um, if if research is. Um, does come out for an indication for GLP-1s for binge eating disorder, if it will trickle down to those without a BMI yeah. uh, in the obesity category. We might see we might see a whole different perspective on these medications. Um, you know, we're not practicing that way now. Uh, I'll definitely want to throw that out there. But um, when as other indications come out, it will change the way that we look at practice. So. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot there's a lot coming up, I feel, um, but the research has to be done. The future is now. Well, thanks, Dr. Danielle, for coming on and chatting about this. Um, anybody, make sure you're giving us, uh, sharing this with anybody you, that you know that may struggle with binge eating. Um, and uh, thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks, guys.